Hello and welcome to the next episode of Coffee and Comebacks and welcome Sarah Furness. Sarah is an author, a speaker, an executive coach and has spent 20 years previously flying as an RAF helicopter pilot and I'm sure we'll go into some of those interesting stories around that. I'm really interested in though Sarah to hear about what's coming up which is the launch of your new book Fly High which I know we're going to go into and speak more about but also around your business interests and everything that you've got planned. And I know you, hopefully you'll share that with, with our listeners. So if I can hand over to you for you to, to expand on what I've just said and give us more of an insight into you and who you are. Yeah, um, thank you very much for inviting me along on the show. It's a great, to, great to chat to you. Um, yes, where do I start? I suppose I, yeah, the obvious thing is that I've flew helicopters in the RAF for 20 years and it's because of that that I'm doing what I am doing now in the latter part of my career I just became very interested in in how the mind works and how we can help people to really just achieve it that achieve their best and fulfill their potential and I was sort of learning things about my own what was going on in my own head so that then led to me getting qualified as a coach and then also getting onto the speaker kind of industry because I discovered that people quite like hearing helicopter stories and it's quite a good way of getting the message out there uh, whilst also um, hopefully entertaining people. And then the last bit of the puzzle, I suppose, was writing the book, which really is everything that I think people need to know to become kind of... Um, higher flyers than already because they're probably already high flyers because let's face it you're all fantastic um but how can we fly higher than ever before so that's a potted history <laughs> i'm sure we can go into more depth anything that you want to know yeah and one thing we did miss and obviously we said before we came on air is the most important role of all is that you're a mother and you yeah. juggle everything that you do with parenting as many of us listening do so it'd be interesting to to delve into that as well and, and share sort of how, how you found that through the year, through years. But could we go back then to your time as a RF helicopter pilot? Could you give us a brief insight into what those key milestones look like for you mm. and, and some of the challenges that you had along the way and how you overcame them? Yeah. Um, oh, I mean, gosh, how, how do you summarize 20 years? Um, probably badly but I think the thing that really that I um, found was a challenge which I also really benefited actually from learning to get through was um, you know I, I just wanted to be I wanted to be liked I wanted to be accepted the military's got this brilliant kind of sense of camaraderie it's all about teamwork and and it's great to be to sort of belong and and there were times I didn't always feel like that. And that's not to sort of throw stones at the RAF. You know, that was that was in my head, a lot of it. But that was something that I was aware kind of interfered a little bit with, you know, my potential and how happy I felt at the times and perhaps wanting to conform. So it's something that I definitely am keen to help other people with is, you know, understanding that we all want to belong and we all want to be part of a tribe. And that can be incredibly enriching but also having the courage and the self-confidence to, to stand up for what we think is the right thing to do and to show our own kind of unique um, awesomeness, I suppose. Mm. Yeah, and you speak a lot about giving permission, as in giving yourself permission and awareness. Would you say at the time, and you, you speak about awareness there, did you have the awareness at the time or do you feel like giving yourself that permission is something that's grown with your awareness? Mm definitely came later on in life I think I was very occupied with wanting to be liked and doing what I thought I needed to do to be liked and I didn't have the awareness until really quite you know quite recently I suppose and again that's what's caused the change in career was that I needed to give myself permission to be Sarah and not try and be someone that I wasn't um 
and also give other people permission to be who they were you know and if they don't like me because I'm a bit mouthy then that's also fine <laughs> you can't be everything to everyone so permission's been a really really kind of key key word um, for me and it's definitely something that I've got to grips with much later on in life and it's something that I hope I can help other people get to maybe a little bit earlier and save themselves some of the pain that perhaps I went through. Yeah, that would be brilliant to to go back into that as well. But whilst we're on that side of your your story, and you said about finding it difficult to obviously summarise 20 years, what about your greatest achievement? If you were able to bring it down to one or a number of your sort of greatest achievements, how would you share those with, with us? I know um, I'd caveat that with there'll be some operational elements that you wouldn't be able to share. But in terms of what you can share, what would you yeah. say is your... God, and it's it's such a good question. I think probably what I'm proudest of is towards the end of my career when I was in a leadership role, I was a flight commander and I was leading on you know, operational detachments in Afghanistan. And again, you know, I was really grappling with my own kind of, oh, well, they like me and, and still wanting to be kind of popular, <laughs> which you can't always be when you're a leader. And there were times that I definitely did stand up for what I thought was the right thing to do and and I think that 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 was that was the right thing to do and also I was very guided I think by becoming a um, a parent I think up until that point I'd probably seen leadership very much as kind of like this way boys (laughs) and you know I'm saying boys on purpose because it was mostly you know men Um, but it was very much about being out front and being the loudest and drinking the most beer and being the strongest um, and I think something slightly evolved in me when I became a parent and I realized actually it's about letting people spread their own wings, you know, quite literally. And so I became a bit, bit more of a nurturing leader and I was finding my feet very much with this, but I remember my chain of command kind of saying, you're too motherly in the way that you go about this. And actually, when I look back on that now, I'm proud of that because I think it was maybe a side of leadership that wasn't quite so prevalent in the Air Force and it would have been easy to conform with what I thought was the right thing to do but I was guided by what felt right to me and I think that that is um you know something that I'm really keen to help other people do now and find their own strengths and and where they can really help people grow and nurture yeah that authentic side of leadership can be really difficult can't it in certain environments and I think actually if you're not aware of where your natural environment um sorry lateral natural leadership style sits then it can be really difficult to also bring out that authenticity and I can relate to that actually I think that as a mother you look at life really differently you have a self-awareness that's different you also have a bit of a self-preservation that's potentially different as well did that come into your obviously with with your type of career did that start to play into your mindset as well and the way that you led not only others but also the choices that you were making yourself? For sure. Um, I think, you know, it's not a game anymore. And that's not to say that people who aren't parents are, are less important or um, that their lives are more expendable, but it, it certainly made me grow up a little bit and realise, you know, it's actually not that clever to get blown up if your child is then an orphan. You know? um, and also, I think it probably helped me to get some perspective because I always knew I was going to deploy as a mother. I didn't have a problem with that. Um, but when I was deployed at the same time as Arthur's father, who's also in the military, that was quite a, a turning point for me because I realized they're going to just keep doing this. They're always, you know, they don't care that Arthur's got, you know, no parents at home, but I cared. That, that really kind of crossed the line for me. And it helped me to realize that no one is ever going to tuck my kid into bed at night if I'm not the one you know, making those bold decisions. So it helped me to realize that perhaps my priorities had changed and I was ready to look at other options outside of the military. Mm. Which is a nice segue into the the transitional (laughs) element um, in terms of how you made the decision and then the journey you've been on since leaving the RAF. So did you spend time before you made the decision to hand in your notice and move into the civilian environment to really sit back and think about what was important to you as as you said or is that something you have done since you you left I think a bit of both I think the word 
in my mind is, is kind of evolution. Um, I definitely had that, that moment of reckoning when I was in Afghanistan and Arthur was at home with you know no parents. I thought, actually, I'm not sure this is necessarily what I want to do forever. And that led me into a teaching role where I was teaching at Defence Academy of the UK and teaching air safety. And I realised, you know, we're obviously very consumed with air safety in the aviation world because if people crash, they die. And it also is expensive because we mangle helicopters. Um, so we want to learn about how not to um, have accidents. And what I discovered was it's really all about what's going on up here. Um, there's an awful lot of resilience and, uh, you know, emotional intelligence and all those kind of skills that we might not have associated with flying. And it became really obvious to me that these are things that we needed to these are tools that we need it to have. So I grew in confidence, I suppose, that this was where I wanted to now focus my energy. And then when I decided to take that leap, magically COVID kind of happened, not that we would wish that on ourselves. And it gave me really quite a great opportunity to go online and start doing webinars and online coaching, initially just for military people for free, um, but it allowed me to kind of grow in confidence and to start growing a client base. So in some ways, I was I was very um, lucky to have that transition period during the COVID pandemic. Yeah, I, I would agree because it's the reach, isn't it? That if you're able to adapt, and let's face it, most of us had to adapt in some way during the yeah. pandemic in the way that we engaged, even if it was socially. I don't know how many online quiz nights that you did <laughs> or, you know, <laughs> socials I remember our work Christmas social was online for for one of the years so it just you just had to adapt didn't you but actually yeah. for some people that go okay this is a brilliant opportunity to increase my reach and engagement mm -hmm. for others that can be quite difficult did you find that when you were creating those new relationships as you say that the the virtual environment actually gave you a different reach into their lives or or was it very similar to face to face no, I think it was completely different. Uh, it was completely new. Uh, we were, you know, as I would say, I was quite resistant to the idea. Um, but it just simply made things possible. And and I was amazed that people kept sort of turning up to these. I used to run Wellness Wednesday sessions for the MOD. And I was amazed people kept turning up. And also I started to see familiar faces. So they were obviously coming back for more. Um, so, no, I think it was quite humbling in a way that, you know, what you think you know about um, how to teach people or how to, you know, help develop people is probably, you know, you probably haven't got it all figured out yet. And there are new opportunities that were presented. Yeah. And again, that sounds like a really interesting hook to come on to. But just on the wellness side of things, you mentioned mm -hmm. about the male dominated environment. And when you took more of a nurturing approach to leadership, it was questioned if you like maybe in certain spaces did you find that actually more men engaged with the wellness side of things as you move through the pandemic or is it still quite heavily dominated by by women because research has shown that women do tend to reach out and mm. talk more often unfortunately male suicide rates are far mm. higher than that of of women and that, I'm just interested in you know if you think about the sort of people that tend to listen to this podcast often ex-military, ex-elite sports and you know any male or female but often they're in that space and it'd be interesting to get your thoughts on what that balance is yeah. like now. I think um, there's a lot of people doing a lot of good work to make it acceptable you know wrong choice of word perhaps but, but to make men feel like it's acceptable to talk about it uh, for sure, I saw in the military, you know, people just not talking about this stuff. And then unfortunately, getting to kind of a breaking point. Um, and it, when I used to run the air safety course, it's nothing to do with well-being. You know, on day one, it's 40 blokes with their arms crossed. Um, and after we've gone for, you know, the obvious drinks on a Monday night, and then we've opened up a bit. By day two, you almost on every course, someone would go, I've actually got stage three burnout, or I've had depression, or, you know, um, my teenage daughter is you know, going through psychological issues. And so what I discovered was that there was an awful lot underneath the surface. And I do think that a lot of work is going on to make that conversation um, more um, acceptable. And again, I think it comes down to permission. Um, I think that if you tell blokes, 
we've got to talk about mental well-being. Uh, understandably, a lot of them might go, nothing wrong with mine, thanks very much. And that's actually kind of how I got onto the speaking circuit, because rightly or wrongly, maybe men won't turn up to talk about mindfulness, but they will turn up to talk about helicopter crashes. <laughs> um, still talking about the same thing, just calling it something different. And if that means I can help people that might have denied themselves of help, then that's what I'm going to do. So I realized in a way that I had a, a kind of a gift in a way that meant that maybe I could connect with some people that might not have been able to access that kind of help. And I wanted to use it. Yeah, that's a really good point, isn't it? Is how do you bring people into a room, literally or, or metaphorically, just to have that conversation? I had a, um, a similar conversation with a, with a guy. I can't say too much because it's a podcast record and it'll be coming out soon, but he's a mental health advocate and he talks about removing the stigma and mm. says that actually, you know, if people won't, you know, share their lived experiences readily, particularly when it comes to men, then it's going to be really difficult to overcome the stigma in organisations, no matter how many initiatives, how many great events you go to. Actually, it's about saying it's okay to have to have the conversation. So I think this links yeah. really, really well into that. But on that note, why do you feel that organisations engage with you then when they, obviously, as you say, you've got a really unique hook, and particularly let, let's face it, as a female in that space, because there are far more men in that space in terms of you know not just flying helicopters, but in in the military. What is it about what you bring into the conversation mm -hmm. that is, you know, is the hook, if you like, for organisation? I've seen some amazing testimonials, one of them being the best in the business. I think that, you know, it says it all. But we'd love to hear from you in terms of, you know, what is it that, that brings you into their organisation? Yeah. Well, I think I'm acutely aware that right now they are looking for female leaders, um, you know, that they're looking for that kind of thing. So diversity and inclusion is, is doing me a great favour right now. Um, I, I think a couple of things I needed to realise was, as you very um, astutely said, women often do talk about their their problems so in some ways I was thinking oh well you know we're still going on about this mental health you know are we over are we overdoing it are we creating a problem that isn't there by talking about something that actually you know maybe we're creating an attachment to loneliness by talking about it too much but I might say that because I'm a woman and I would talk about it what I was a little bit slow to pick up on was that a lot of men won't and we are different and I think it's okay to say that so I think the reason that organizations got me in is because I wonder if men feel safer talking about these things because I am a woman. Um, so that whatever reason creates that kind of psychological safety. But also when I'm telling my story, I'm being very candid about, you know, what, what I was going through and, and, you know, my own limiting beliefs and the things I had to get through. But really it's giving them a voice to their own thoughts and feelings that they might not have done and they don't need to. They don't need to stand up there and go, yeah, you know, I was scared or I was afraid of rejection because I'm doing it. And I'm saying, I'm just going to admit this. And if you recognize any part of yourself in that, then let me reassure you, you're not the only one. And there is a way out. Yeah. And sometimes that's all people need to hear, isn't it? It's not just me. We can be our own worst self-critics, can't we? And think that what we're thinking or feeling is not the right thing and we wouldn't want to share it. And I'm, I'm interested, actually, because I'm looking at your keynote subjects and you talk about three um, particular areas, actually, mm -hmm. without giving away, obviously, too much of your <laughs> of your content. Which would be awesome. I mean, I love the whole point around becoming a ninja. You know, yeah. thinking about creating that Jedi mindset because it doesn't <laughs> matter what sort of situation you're in. You need to have the habits, which again, mm -hmm. your habits form. That'd be great to talk about. So, could we yeah. just go into that a little bit more to give a flavour? So, maybe start with the habits formula. And then if we could go through the train hard, train hard, fight easy, et cetera, that would be, that would be brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, habits, we all know what a habit is, um, but we also love a mnemonic in the, in the Air Force, don't we, or in the military. So it stands for healthy automatic behaviors and threatening scenarios. And really what I'm doing is helping people to create those healthy automatic behaviors. And I won't go through the H A B I T S because we don't have time, and I can I can share all that with you afterwards. 
But the main takeaway for me is it's training. You know, we train our minds to be more resilient under pressure, or we train our minds to focus our attention somewhere where it's helping us as opposed to hindering us under pressure. So really I'm kind of combining mindfulness, which is training your mind with the military aspect, which was, you know, train hard, fight easy. And you know this, don't you? We didn't just rock up to some kind of conflict zone and hope for the best. We trained and trained and trained and trained and trained. Whereas for some reason, when it comes to mental health, or performing under pressure, we expect ourselves to just get it and just be naturally good at it. It's a load of rubbish. We can train ourselves to do it. So it's um, so really it sort of takes those two ideas of what do we need to do? How do we, how does our brain need to behave under pressure? And how can I train myself to do that so that it's such an ingrained behavior? I don't have to think about it, it's automatic. Yeah, I love that. And actually, that's part of what we do when we're in training, isn't it? It's so that when you know, you come under contact or a situation happens, you literally go back to the drills, you go back to basics and it's just, you know, everything's about the drill. We saw it with, you know, the recent Queen's funeral where that was something that had been rehearsed for a long, long time. And obviously very short notice when it was all pulled together, but actually it was immaculate. And that was all because they knew the drill. They had trained really hard, you know, and they were able to execute it in a way that it was just second nature they didn't really need to think about it in the same way so I don't know about you but I've spent the last sort of 15 years in the corporate environment and one of the things that I think would be a great lesson to bring over to that space I think some probably do do it well and I think some try and actually I do think there may be some organizations that don't actually recognize the power of putting their teams through some challenging situations, Mm -hmm. through some tests where they see where the gaps are. And, you know, what's your thoughts on that? And what what sort of lessons or tips might you share with with any listeners today where they can actually start to, you know, exercise that organisational resilience, Mm -hmm. I guess is the term. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I agree with you. Uh, you know, and I th- I'm acutely aware as well that in the military, we sort of have that luxury of being able to train because we don't spend all of our time on the front line. Whereas in a corporate world, you are effectively on the front line True. all the time. But easy to say. Um, so I think our job is to sort of make that manageable in the corporate space. Um, and I get, I think what I would take away from it is very simple actions that you can do repeatedly that you can fall back on under pressure will help. So for me, what I would be teaching people is where you focus your attention is something you can control. And you don't realize that until it's kind of, it's, it's, it's not obvious until it's obvious. A lot of the time we're distracted, whether it's by other people or self-sabotaging thoughts or devices. And you know, it took me a while to realize I can choose to bring my attention back to something that I choose. And I can use that to focus on positive thoughts, or I can use that to focus on a drill, which is gonna help me perform better. But the first, the starting point is focusing your attention where you want it to be. Now, that's something everybody can do. You don't have to have the kind of the military training budget. That's something we can all do when we wake up in the morning. Um, So I think it's about making that training something you can genuinely do in a busy lifestyle but has the same philosophy as sort of train hard, fight easy, keep doing it, keep repeating it. So that the next time you go into a boardroom meeting and you're thinking of having a meltdown, you actually know how to, to steer your brain in a more helpful direction. Yeah, no, I think that's a brilliant tip and such a good point because it can be really hard to embed or take learning on if it's not something that you are going to be doing all of the time. But I, I do agree with your point that you can't be training all of the time. So it's that whole, it's that balance. Um, you also talk about the secret to bomb-proof resilience and resilience is a I think it's a really live conversation just in general Mm. right now isn't it and you know away Mm. from organizational resilience that whole how you build personal resilience Um, what sort of tips do you generally share when you're in a speaking situation or coaching situation and maybe what are your top two or three that you would you would recommend when we think about how we approach challenging Mm. situations or events um so one word it comes down to one word choice um again for a long time I didn't realize I had a choice over what I was thinking what I was feeling 
I felt like I was hostage to the inner critic or whatever it was. And I realized you can choose how much attention you give to these thoughts. That's not to say you kind of live in denial and only think happy thoughts, but you can choose whether or not to spend your time worrying or you can choose to focus on something else. And equally, controlling the controllable. You know, we spend so much time worrying about the future, which I, I get why we all do it, but it's pretty pointless and, you know, doesn't really help us out. So it's controlling the controllable, making little choices every day that we have the power to make for ourselves. I think no matter how small those choices are, when you keep making those choices, you feel like you're in control and you feel powerful. And I think we might have forgotten how to do that because because COVID came in, no one knew what to do. We just followed orders for two years and we forgot to make choices. So I think what I want to do is remind people that you know there is a time and a place for following orders. We get that, we were in the military, but there's a time and a place to exercise your own choices. And I think when you start doing that and the light bulb kind of comes on, again, you can't sort of unsee it then. And you think, oh, actually I'm more powerful than I thought. Yeah, that's great. And it's the compounding effect, isn't it? Of the number of more positive choices that you make. And then when you make those choices, you think, actually, that, that felt good. I can do that again. And it just creates that hopefully virtuous circle. Um, when it comes down to individual leadership, and again, I know we don't have time to really go into the element around fear and how that can drive a lot of behaviours around, around leadership. But what I thought would be a good question to, to ask, which might draw out some of the interesting points for our listeners, is actually, what are the challenges that leaders tend to come to you with? Mm. So what are the common themes that you might discuss, whether that's in an informal setting, setting or in a structured executive sort of leadership scenario? Obviously, again, without giving anything yeah. away in terms of confidentiality. But would you say there are some themes that crop mm. up time and time again that you you would share with us? Yeah, definitely. Um I think it depends how much you want to drill down um, because it might come as, it might manifest as, well, I'm not uh, as effective as communicating as I want to be, um, or I'm not sure if this is for me anymore. Um, when you drill right down, I think it comes down to self-belief. Um, and I used to think that was just me kind of projecting my own narrative because I definitely know that I you know, went through a whole period of like, oh no, I'm terrible. And I realized, gosh, there's a lot of people out there who are incredibly competent and look like they've got it all, who underneath it all just are terrified that they're getting it you know, badly wrong. Um, we call that imposter syndrome these days, don't we? You know, we've got like a trendy, trendy label for it. Um, and, and what I really want to be able to do with my book and with my speeches is A, show people that just because you're thinking it doesn't mean it's true, you know, and I've heard that before, it goes, well, if I, I wouldn't be thinking it if there wasn't substance. No, you're thinking it because you're a human being and we are programmed to self-doubt, it's what keeps us alive. So forgive yourself for thinking that. And actually there's no need to wrestle with it because that's just being human. But the important thing is we get to decide whether or not we're hostage to that belief. So long-winded answer, the short answer is, I think everybody struggles with a bit of self-belief. And what I want to help people do is navigate it as opposed to fight it. Yeah, that's a great way to describe it. And I, I completely agree with your whole point around the thought process and, and the way that we create a narrative in our mind in that for some of us, or you know, I'm sure for some people listening, we can get stuck in the negative thoughts and around 80 or 90,000 thoughts a day of the average human. I've read a fact somewhere, can't quote me on that exactly where, <laughs> but I'm sure I've read it somewhere. And about 60% of those tend to just be negative by their nature, not that you're, but just you might be thinking, mm. oh, it's really cold or that's really annoying or whatever it is, but their thoughts, okay. they're not always a, a reality. And I think reminding ourselves that it's okay to have those thoughts, but actually mm. we can create often the reality, positive or negative. You know, I, mm. I was speaking to somebody this morning, they're talking about speaking something into existence. You know, if you genuinely believe that you are able to do something, you want to do something, you're going to do it, then speak it into existence. Say yeah. that, hi, I'm Sarah, I'm, you know, this or that. And actually, if you don't say that, then why, why or how would others believe that you're this confident, um, effective leader or whatever it is that you're, you're looking to come across as? So I just think that's, 
number one key message, isn't it? And I think you really get that across in everything that I've read and, and listened to with you. Which leads me on to your book. Um, I was actually lucky enough to be somebody that was shared one of the chapters of your book after an event oh, last week. So yeah. thank you for sharing that. Um, but what led you to write the book? You sort of hinted about mm. it at the start of the conversation, but you know, I've met a lot of people that will say, there's a book in me. I say that all the time and I still haven't written it, but I will, I commit to it here. I yeah. will write a book. I'm just not sure when. Um, but it's that piece, isn't it? That you actually, you did it. You have sat down, you have done the, the hardest thing, which is actually putting pen to paper, making it happen. And it's about to launch. So could you talk us through your reason why, but also your journey yeah. through writing yeah. your book? Um, there's two reasons. One is the business angle. Um, I'm a speaker. I'm a coach. Um, a lot of speakers and coaches have books, so it lends a bit of credibility. Um, and also it provides another option for support. So if you don't want to go into a, um, a coaching program, time or money, you can buy the book for $13.99. So I hope I can reach a lot more people and, you know, a lot more future Sarahs. So, you know, maybe the top level CEOs do have the budget to, to work one on one. But, you know, I would have liked to have read this book 20 years ago. And, you know, so hopefully I'm making it possible for for more people to access um, the techniques that I've learned. So that's kind of the business side. And it does then segue into the, you know, the passion behind it. Um, there was a, a long period in my life when I imagined I was the only person in pain, the only person who's finding it difficult. Um, and actually it was quite humbling to go into the air safety world and the coaching world and realize, God, you know what, everyone's just as scared as, as I am. And I actually found that to uh, be a very, humanizing experience and and a very bonding experience because I realized um this is the human race you know this is what we're all like and I I feel this sort of compassion and warmth I know that sounds a bit woo but I really do I want every human to feel as good as they deserve to feel and I remember what it felt like to be scared and lonely and I know that there are lots of other people out there who are scared and lonely and I want to I want to show them some hope and show them a way out um, because I think humans are incredible what they can do. So, you know, that's the the kind of the more noble ambition is to, to give people the self-belief I think they deserve to have. Yeah. And did you have um, the fear when you were writing your book and when you got to the point of sharing it? What, can you share with us how that felt? Um, no, I'm quite a sort of, if I say I'll do something, I tend to just get on and do it. My... Um, lots of people sort of procrastinate my uh, I have the other problem I'm quite impetuous so if if I decide to do something I just get on and do it and then think I could have probably thought that one through a bit more um so probably not when the book was then out and I sort of reread it I went oh my goodness why did you write that Sarah <laughs> um but I did have a book coach um so I, to sort of answer your previous question that was brilliant because, you know, I would say to Anne-Marie, you can have chapter due by this date. Uh, and I would I would do it, you know, we're born people pleasers. So if you say to someone you're going to do something, it's a good way of keeping your promises. So I would advocate anyone who is thinking about writing a book, turn that into positive action, hire a book coach. Um, I've got one I can recommend. And they will just help you actually put pen to paper. Yes, yeah, that accountability, isn't it? Like you say, yes. when you commit to something and you've got to, yeah. well, it's worth saying to somebody you haven't done something that you yeah. said you would do. So it's that whole, I, I didn't actually know book coaches existed. So, so I've learned that and others yeah. listening. So that's something you'd recommend, getting on board with a book coach and then they help you shape where your thinking's going yeah. and create accountability. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, I think gone are the days where, you get a publishing deal with Penguin. I mean, you know, I'm still open for business for book two, if Penguin are listening, but you know, it's not like you've got your editor. Um, a lot of us self-publish these days, that's, that's what I did. So the book coach is kind of that person that to, you know, provide that accountability and that, but also a, probably a bit more coaching as opposed to just have chapter one done by this day. They help you see what the book's going to yeah. look like, work out who you're writing it for and all that kind mm. of stuff. Yeah, that visualization. Do you use techniques such as visualization in your coaching or when you're speaking? Or is that not something that comes into your? Oh, that's a really interesting story. Uh, sorry, question. <laughs> um, 
I've answered the question in that I probably use stories um, more than visualization. And I'll tell you why. I think it's because I'm quite kinesthetically biased. I can tell you how I felt. Um, I can't necessarily tell you what it looked like as well. So I know that my strength and my leaning is thinking about what I remember in my head and how I was feeling. I'm very tuned into my emotions. So I feel like I, I kind of want to help people with that side of things because I'm very comfortable in that area. I'm not as good with the visualization side of things. Yeah, but that's a really good point, though, isn't it? That we all see and work in a different way. You know, mm. as you say, there are different auditory visual, you know, in terms of our dominant sort of way that we tend to learn and grow. But also when it comes to working with individuals, it's trying to identify, well, how are we going to get the best out of each other? Are they somebody that likes to, are they a real doer? Are they somebody that needs real push if they're going to do things? So I think that's part of the skill of the coach, isn't it? Is, is working out with and also knowing your strengths and weaknesses and where you, you feel comfortable. Um, yeah, definitely. What are you most excited about other than the book launch? Which it'd be great if you can just tell us a bit more detail about that and what's to come. We've got some key dates. I know next week's uh, actually this week is yeah. a big is a big date. Um, yeah. But yeah, what are you most excited about in terms of the future and the next coming I mean, months mm. and years with the work that you're doing? I think I am. I am very excited about, um, I suppose, going kind of global, which sounds a bit uh, egomaniac, whatever that word is. Um, but it, it, you were talking about speaking things into existence. And I had this kind of utopian dream during COVID when I was homeschooling that we were going to do a gap year uh, when my son was eight, which is next year probably not going to happen um because he's on his third school and his father's gone can we stop moving him around <laughs> um but the sort of the idea was born that I was like right 2023 is global international year I'm going to do a world book tour I'm going to go around the world I'm going to go to Australia Singapore and I'm going to make this happen um and again because I tend to just sort of be so stubborn that I want to see things true um it's starting to take shape um you know and I've been signed up for an Australian um speaker bureau um, hopefully I'm going to get some organizations in the Middle East and Singapore. So I think I'm excited just to kind of see what's possible, you know, and if you just dare to, to say, I want to try that and prepared to look a bit stupid when it doesn't happen. Actually, a lot of the time it does, you know, and it's, so I guess I'm excited by how limitless and uncertain the future is and the opportunities that that brings me. That is amazing. I mean, I'm excited for you, for you and obviously be following that journey but I think that's a really good message for us isn't it where I think there's a few things in there one about not being afraid to fail you know mm -hmm. trying things acknowledging that sometimes it'll go really well other times it won't and actually rather than be embarrassed about it be proud that you tried it and you're willing to put yourself out there give it a go but know when it's time to move on to the next thing I think the other thing is about just broadening horizons and and mm -hmm. sort of doing things to make it happen isn't it it's taking that action and it's a bit like when, when people might say, oh, well, I really, you know, I wish I could do that or I wish I could, you know, it might be run a marathon or, you know, just using a really rudimentary ex example. Well, then book your place on a marathon Absolutely. and put your trainers on. You know, it's those yeah. things of, of just do it. So I love what you say there um, about, about the global book tour, going global. Um, can you give us a bit more information on Fly Higher and how the yeah. whole launch is going to happen? Because there are certain dates as well that we yes, want to be aware yeah. of. Thank, <laughs> thank you for asking. Um, so, yes, Fly Higher. A little bit about the title. Um, I, you know, essentially, I believe that, you know, we're all high flyers, as it were. And a lot of the people that will pick this book up will already be high flyers. So the first thing is a mark of respect, really, to my reader that you, know, you don't need me to tell you um, how to, to sort of ace it, you're already acing it. Um, but maybe that's not the challenge. Maybe the challenge is I don't always feel like I uh, deserve to be where I am and, and, and how do I get to the next step? So that's why it's called Fly Higher. Um, and so the, the book launch is happening in Henley on the 3rd of October. And that's another really good story about speaking things into existence because 
the Henley Literary Festival. It's huge, you know, the most amazing authors go there. I'm a complete unknown, but I live in Henley. So I just emailed these lovely people and went, do you need a Henley author? I know you don't know me, but I live in Henley. Did I mention that I live in Henley? <laughs> <laughs> and then I was in kind of Henley life and Henley standard and I said you know at the bottom I say Sarah Furness is writing her first book which will be published in time for Henley Literary Festival brackets one can hope and um, and eventually they relented and gave me a slot so I don't know if that's uh, kind of verging on bullying or if that's manifestation you <laughs> could decide um Fair but, yeah, <laughs> the point, I know exactly it works um <laughs> so, so I've got a slot at Henley Literary Festival at 10 a.m. on the 3rd of October in the Town Hall, and that's going to be the book launch for the physical book. And then the big date is 5th and 6th of October is when it goes on Amazon, and that's when you can pick up a Kindle copy for 99p just on those two days. After that, it goes back up to normal price. But also, as an extra thank you to anyone who buys my book, uh, the Kindle book, on those two days, I will offer a discounted signed copy of my book. Um, it's really important that I try and get some Kindle sales. I'll be really honest, it's because that's the best seller campaign. So the more Kindle uh, books I sell on that day, the higher up the rankings it goes. So you're doing me a favor uh, by buying a 99p book and I will reward you by giving you a discounted signed copy, if that sounds wow. That's amazing. A note in the diary. So in a couple of days, we'll be <laughs> logging on. Although I don't have Kindle, so that's going to be a slight, unless you can do it through other platforms. But well, I'm, you can, I'm hoping uh, you to be there download. on Monday. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to seeing you there. Um, yeah, and obviously, you know, don't buy the Kindle if it's not going to work for you. Um, but uh, you can download, like I've got an iPad and you can read it on the iPad using various apps. So uh, you don't have to have a Kindle um Amazing. but uh, but don't worry i'll still do you a good deal sounds like a plan <laughs> looking forward to it so I, i'd like to just end on a high in terms of conversation so i feel like we've been actually it's gonna be a real fun here flying high the whole conversation so uh we've been waiting to get that in but on a serious <laughs> note i feel like we could actually have a lot of conversation and have gone into so much more detail around what you do but I do think by reading your book as well and we'll, we'll include some links as well so that people can have a look at your website they'll be able to find out more about you and, and what you do and hopefully get in touch but going back to the, the sort of high point mm. what would you say has been the most valuable lesson that you've learned in making your transition out mm. of the military and into a new career space your golden nugget for my golden nugget listening. learning to be my own empathetic witness lots of psychobabble in there for you but um essentially you know i spent a lot of time worrying about what other people thought wanting other people to say that it was okay or to, to um make me feel better when i was having a hard time and it was learning that actually I needed to listen to my own emotions and sometimes just grieve and just go yeah that was a bit of rubbish um so it I, I learned eventually to stop looking out all the time almost for approval um and I don't know again if that's a military thing because we're so kind of in in with everyone else but it was learning to look inwards um and go you know what Sarah you've got this you know you don't need everyone to tell you that you're wonderful all the time um, you know just be the best person you can be so it's a bit of a a trite example but um, it took me a long time to learn that um, and I'm I feel much more secure now that I do and it is what I want to help other people learn is that you know they've, they've got it in them everything they need is right here and you don't need anyone else it's not to say we don't want to feel supported and have great relationships but everything you need is right here yeah and it comes back to your point about South Police isn't it and you're just showing that that's something you've you've built and obviously something you have to maintain it's one of those muscles if you like that once you've got to that space of having that self-belief it's about maintaining it and creating that support network around you and it sounds as though that's something that's been happening in spades um over not just the last few years but obviously the network that you had within the military as well so Best of luck with the book launch and the Going Global next year. Hopefully we'll have you back on even when you're a best-selling author, if you're willing Absolutely. to do that. Um, Definitely. But in the meantime, it's been fab to speak with you, Sarah, and um, we hope to speak again soon. Absolutely. Well, I look forward to seeing you next week and thank you for having me on the show.
Thanks, Sarah.